Welcome back to 100 Years of NASDAR History. I ended the first presentation on the history of NASDAR in 1928, when NASDAR moved to 4014 North Rockwell Street in Chicago. The company remained in this location throughout the Great Depression. The company had introduced two new products, a primer for metal and wooden signs and water-based paints for brushing on signs. In the fall of 1929, the United States suffered the great stock market crash, which had a devastating effect on the entire economy that was also part of a worldwide depression. It was not until the spring of 1933 that the U.S. stock market slowly regrained ground lost in 1929. I think one of the best ways we can gauge the economic effect this had on the company during this time is in their advertising. Sign of the Times magazine was the primary publication for the sign industry at the time. Prior to the marketing crash in September of 1929, the ads NASDAQ ran in the 1920s slowly grew in size from a small 1 16th inch page to a full page ad in 1926. One third page were most common in the late 20s, so a full page ad demonstrated the company was prosperous. We could not find any NASDAQ ads from the fall of 1929 until January of 1932, indicating economic hardship for the company. In the years 1932 to 1935, the company ran small ads in Sign of the Times magazine. It was not until 1935 that the ads started to get bigger, indicating business was picking up. So what changed in 1935? The WPA, or Works Progress Administration. This was a government-funded program that was part of the American New Deal agency that started in May of 1935 to construct public buildings, roads, and parks. A part of this program was Federal Project No. 1 that included the Federal Art Program, which by 1936 employed more than 5,000 artists. Many of these artists created WPA posters, and many of those posters were silkscreen printed with NASDAQ inks. This changed our business. The need to reproduce poster art in greater quantities was huge. At this time, there were three commercial printing processes for the printing of posters and signage. The letterpress process, lithography, stone or plate, offset had yet to be invented, and silkscreen. Poster art demanded bright, bold color, and silkscreening was the best method for printing these posters. Many of the artists printed these signs and posters by manually pulling a squeegee as this was the lowest cost of entry printing process. But there were also automatic machines used at this time. This is a drawing of one of those machines used at this time. This machine was patented by Edward Owens in 1923 and widely used by the late 1930s. It was a cylinder type of press based on letterpress printing machines. Remember, Edward Owens was the first president of NASDAQ. By this time, silkscreen printing was being done around the world. Similar posters and signage were being printed in England, Europe, Australia, and Latin America. By the time the federal art program started in 1935, NASDAQ was making two types of inks for silkscreen printing. These inks were both enamels. The first NASDAQ inks made silkscreening were considered oil stencil paste, which dried slowly by oxidation and were basically modified enamel house paints. In 1935, NASDAQ introduced new weatherproof silkscreen enamels. These inks were designed for outdoor weathering in signage, but were also being used by poster printers. By this time, there were water base and lacquer inks on the market but the slow drying enamels were the most printer friendly because they did not dry in the screen during the printing process. This image shows the 1937 ad introducing a new NASDAQ catalog. In 1936, artist Anthony Valonis brought the silk screening process to the federal art program. 
WPA posters were being hand painted at one, one at a time. Silk screening with automatic presses could now produce as many as 600 posters a day. The WPA posters are iconic. There are more than 900 of these original prints in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. In 1942, the WPA art projects were transferred to the Defense Department to support the war effort. One of the great stories about these posters is the series of National Park posters. These were a part of the original WPA poster program. By 1971, most of these original posters were damaged or had been thrown away. At that time, park ranger Doug Lean came across a Grand Teton poster that was being thrown away at the park he worked at. He fell in love with the images and spent years learning about the posters and finding original images in photographs and in collections. He started a company that reproduces the original posters and created new ones in the old WPA art style. These posters are printed with NASDAR 5500 series ink at Cole Printing in Seattle, Washington. Ranger Doug Lean sends us posters because he's a nice guy. These posters are on the walls of the Shawnee office and can be purchased at every National Park gift shop and online. These posters were printed on uncoated paper. Enamel inks will dive into the uncoated paper and multiple layers of ink will end up having varying levels of gloss. In response to this, NASDAR developed the yellow label inks with the product code 5500. These inks are the inks that we received in our Mr. Signman silkscreen kit, and here's an example of one of these cans of ink. This ink became the standard for all poster printing for years to come. In 1941, the United States enters World War II, following England and Europe, who've already been at war. In February of 1942, NASDAR moves to 469 Milwaukee Avenue in Chicago. Also in February, NASDAR presents this ad that gives us the new address and a listing of inks available. The lineup of inks for NASDAR at the time include the new weatherproof enamel, a 700 line of fast dry process colors, which are lacquer, yellow label inks, the flat poster ink I just showed you, and the 2500 line of inks, which are also lacquers. In this same year, an interesting note I found in the Sign of the Times magazine was a story indicated that the very first silkscreen t-shirts appear in a Life magazine article on the Air Corps Gunnery School. This at 1943 ad promotes silkscreen supplies in war bonds. As the war's getting close to an end, Victory greetings are in order in this 1944 December ad. So after years of war, what is the best thing to cheer up a, do a male-dominated printing industry? Woman, of course. Advertisings like these become common throughout the late 40s and 50s. I can assure you that this is not how we currently do weathering in tech service today. In May of 1947, NASDAR runs a 25th anniversary ad in the Sign of the Times magazine. This ad promotes 25 years of leadership, inks, and supplies. The yellow page is actually silkscreened in the magazine. Now to end the coverage of the first 25 years of NASDAR, here's another 25th anniversary ad. This ad shows us pictures of the President Howard Parmalee, Bob Doran, Vice President, E.H. Cook, Chemist, and Elmer Cortram, Manager of the Photo Department, with the motto, at the inception of the company, it was decided that quality was to be the keynote of the line of silkscreen materials and equipment. Thanks to all of you that maintain this motto today. Join me next month when we move into the 1950s and the introduction of plastics in signage. And until then, Nazdrovia.